So this is the second of the Will Nikon Survive or the Will Nikon Thrive series of videos. Now in this one, we're going to understand if Nikon actually has been acting as, as part of strategy and what is that strategy based on what we know about what they've been doing and what's their actual financial health, real financial health and what can you foresee about the brand? What's going to be the strategy or tactic going forward? So if you look at the brand overall, you will see two things about Nikon right now, how they've been acting or let's say, approaching the market. If you look at the market, you will see that they have offered in the form of Z50 and also in the coming Z30, inexpensive entry-level Z-mount mirrorless bodies. Uh, I'm assuming that the Z30 is going to be uh, joining the family very soon. So I'm addressing both of them in plural. So, so they are an inexpensive entry point. And remember D5600, which was one of the highest selling uh, DSLRs. In fact, last year also D5600 was one of the top two or top three most selling uh, DSLRs. So now they have discontinued that. But that price segment, although the market is premiumizing, that price segment is there and it, it's sort of... The uh, people who are uh, first time users of a camera, they are enthusiasts or they are learning and they, they'll move on to better or more expensive products in the future. If you think about it, the role of these bodies, APS-C bodies, crop sensor bodies is to draw people in and that's the job that Z50 does and that's the job that Z30, Z30 will do. Now on the other hand, what they have been doing is they are sort of providing extremely high value products but they're confusing the mid-range. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. In the, in the entry segment, what they're offering right now is first they're offering Z-mount APS-Cs. Uh, the brand with the highest equity in that segment right now is Fuji, but Fuji actually comes at a premium if you look at APS-C bodies. And uh, Fuji's D5600 level cameras are not as good. And Fuji... APS-C lines simply cannot fight, fight the perceptual superiority of full frame. And you have to understand that. And this is this this is an emotional thing. People, there is a perception of full full frame being the standard, being the best. Uh, and, and, and when you evolve and when you realize that, you know, sensor size matters, but to some extent, that's probably after that guy has been using a camera system for five, six years that he goes up over it goes beyond it and then looks at fuji with a different kind of lens it's like you know when you have rich and have been rich for a long time it doesn't matter what car you drive and it can still appear as you can still carry your status just with the presence on the other hand if you look at the full frame side of, uh, of the business they have the z5 right now which is going to be about 1300 us dollars it's a very complete camera it's a very complete camera what what is the completion for z5 yours are it's old it's very limited a7C, I mean, it's it's good, but it's expensive. It doesn't go up to one eight thousandth of a second. It doesn't have uh, customizable buttons. It's not easy to hold. There are issues with that camera, but you have a nice flip screen. It's essentially a vlogging camera. Also, it doesn't have dual card slots. So a lot of people who want to have future-proof prof professional body, which in future can at least be become a backup body, Zif Z5 is that uh, camera. XT4. The simple reason is that it is an APS-C body, so for a lot of people, it will not cut the eyes. Now, the discounted Z6, uh, you might start getting the Z6 around 1800, 1700 market and use Z6 at around 1500 in the market. But let's not talk about the used uh, market. Let's look at a new Z6 today in the market at around 1700, 1750 uh, US dollars. And that suddenly is such a great proposition. If you see the way Nikon is cutting the market thing, you have at you have a great product at, at 1300 then you know add 400 uh, more uh, dollars and you have the z6 200 more you have the z62 you add 500 more dollars and uh, you have a z7 which gives you 45 megapixels and the pretty nice nice camera with 64 base iso you add two three hundred more and you, you get a z z72 so if you look at how they have been cutting the market fine and they're offering you value plus Nikon reliability. I think that has been the strategy of Nikon. The really good all-rounder cameras. What it is doing, it is confusing the mid-range by offering a lot more value than the competition is offering. What else is Nikon doing? 
if you look at their overall imaging uh, products business you have to understand nikon says that their the, the pro and hobbyist market will move from being 29% in 2016 to 65% in 2022 third quarter in a, in a year in a one and a half years that market is going to uh, constitute the bulk of the market and that is the market that nikon is targeting nikon said that in 2016 60% of their consumer base were already pro and hobbyist and in 2022 by the time the market is about 60% made of of pro and hobbyists 80% of nikon's sales will come from them so you have a clear market segmentation that nikon has in mind which means you're selling higher end products at a premium nikon is also saying that by that time nikon would have reduced their business cost by 59% from 2016 to 2022 by 59% so two things are clear as the market shrinks and more of the market becomes about pro and hobbyists nikon is going to focus there and produce premium products at the same time as they're selling more expensive products the cost of doing business for them will come down by 59% so nikon is looking for a niche market with high profitability it is something that fuji is also doing currently but fuji is operating with, with a base of 4% of the market make for the pro and the hobbyist market one second build up the z line uh, z lens line up very quickly reduce business cost and all of this forms the overall strategy of actually making profit the imaging division making profit of it even if the revenue is 1.5 billion dollars so they are making their entire business a far more efficient business and they are therefore investing in the right areas what are the kind of spaces they're investing in you've heard recently that you know uh, nikon is reducing um, manpower in many of the overseas markets so wherever they think that they can do with less manpower they're reducing manpower there so that is one way of reducing cost but cost saving is not efficiency or productivity uh, there has to be intelligent investment also so what they have been doing for the last 2 uh, 3 years as you can see in the graph is that, is that from 2019 onwards they're shifting their manpower to more profitable areas of growth they call it uh, main, uh, so they're saying that maintain current levels and shift to growth area they're just being more intelligent about where to spend money so if you look at nikon's survival strategy you're getting four big points save operating costs faster than the speed of the market shrinkage so the market is shrinking in value but your cost of doing business should come down faster than the potential of making revenue in the market right uh, for example just moving the manufacturing units to thailand will save them 758 million dollars and that is going to happen every year they are going to reduce cost by reducing 20% of the overseas manpower that's a lot of uh, money saved there shift head count to profit making areas like we discussed and already they have planned for profit at 1.5 billion dollars revenue and they make more money than just 1.5 billion right now and in the foreseeable future so survival isn't a problem really the question is will they thrive and what do they need to do to be able to grow now if you look at the market overall right now as you can see on the screen right now for a lot of people who are satisfied easily the phones will do but for a lot of people the phones will pique their interest it it will just get them introduced to the world of photography and making videos and making content so phones understand will keep driving interest and phones will keep recruiting so the smaller aps and crop sensor cameras which is to sort of introduce people into photography and making videos that's going to be replaced by phones so the, and the camera brands know that so cameras now need to convert the interest generated by consumers who use phones right so that is the overall camera market strategy therefore understand that when people today come in and buy a camera they're going to come it uh, buy it at a more uh, at a significantly higher price because they're not going to buy a very entry level camera anymore especially in the near future so therefore the real camera experience has to be significantly superior than the phone camera experience right 
and what a, what is the camera experience the camera experience is made of a few things firstly the image quality and output how do the colors look how much can you edit them how flexible are the files because you know when you're getting into you you really can't do much with a phone camera's file but when you get a cam uh, file from a real camera that experience that experience of editing learning the colors that you see the way you're able to crop a picture and still get fantastic you know uh, image output out of a crop picture those things are going to matter for people who are, who are graduating from phones to cameras ergonomics and ease of operation look people are today used to using a screen and it's, it's so intuitive for them so when they move on to a camera which you have to grip like this and hold like that it is it's important that they find using the camera extremely easy because when they're just uh, starting out if the whole thing becomes very difficult very complicated a lot of people might just lose interest or at least lose interest in the brand if not in the whole photography thing so but if you are able to give them a very pleasant experience with ergonomics how the camera bodies feel and the fact that it's weather sealed you can use them anywhere all that cameras can be used anywhere because they're weather sealed i can take it to a beach in fact i, I remember when i was using d5600 and we went to a beach and i thought well can I take it out? I use my D750 uh, instead of using that uh, 5600 because it was not weather sealed. These kind of things will not be tolerated because if you, if people are spending, putting in that money, they would like to actually use it anywhere. So ergonomics and ease of operation. Also the third point, reliability and durability. And all these three things are the strong points on their fantastic image output, fantastic colors, brilliant files as you know. Ergonomics and ease of operation, I think Nikon is the best in the market. There's, there's nothing that beats Nikon. Fuji X-T3 comes close in terms of how the buttons are layout and how um, how customizable they are. But, you know, the grip, the overall other feel of the camera, the way you can carry them, um, obviously the full frame cameras are better. Now, I'm going to talk to you about how Nikon is actually very smartly approaching the market by understanding the market very well. Look. Most people, are, like I said, are happy with any camera on their phones. But those who are not happy with any camera, they will buy a camera at a premium. And that premium is getting bigger, right? So if you look at this graph, you see that the compact, the compact cameras have been sort of uh, washed out of the market. They have become sort of obsolete, irrelevant. And that is what has been uh, replaced by the phones. And interchangeable lens cameras, if you look at the data, actually have been forming a larger niche if you look at uh, from 79 to 2019 in this how many years about 30 years the market of interchangeable lens cameras have definitely grown and they are actually holding on to the market better than people talk about now the phone market is of course as you know is saturated phone uh, growth in phone market phone market is not happening anymore so if they want a better experience the next thing is the cameras and understand most phones are sold on the basis of how good their cameras are most innovations in the phone are, are around the camera now if we look at this chart carefully the red buildings are actually the sales of lenses and as you can see lenses are doing much better than bodies because the average person buys at least two lenses 1.7 lenses uh, to a body that's the ratio in the market so lenses are doing better now although unit sales have gone down the value has actually held up much better in fact cameras are getting more premiums so nikon has to find a space to charge a premium uh, to make money full frame lenses are more expensive than crop sensor lenses what does that mean it means that if nikon wants to operate with a smaller base and with, with much lesser operation cost and target a niche market which is also a premium market they will focus primarily on full frame bodies and full frame lenses so you might not see a lot of uh, APC body focused lenses coming from Nikon because they will make more money by selling full frame lenses the role of the APC bodies in the Nikon system is just to draw people in and get them to be introduced so where can Nikon charge a premium like you said if you look at this market I know I'm, I'm probably making this very complicated but just stay on it for a second if you look at it Nikon is actually looking at a mid premium market just the right market where they have positioned the Z6 the Z5 the um, Sony has also positioned the A7C quite nicely there the Z7 
the Z8 is going to be slightly towards uh, uh, the highest side and that's going to charge the innovation premium. I do not know if they're going to charge as much of the innovation premium that Sony has charged. In fact, Canon R5, I would say, is also quite reasonably priced and the Z8 or the Z9 is probably be going to uh, at the, around the same price as Nikon, uh, as Canon R5. I'd like to explain the chart to you here for a second. Uh, essentially, the innovation is happening with two things. First, much faster scanning high resolution sensors. That's one big area of innovation. Because if you're able to do that, you can move into uh, silent shooting easily. You'll do much better video, uh, produce much better files from the video and fast moving videos. Secondly, brands are focusing on developing better processors. Look, these, these are essentially you know, mini computers. Now, the processor, therefore, is a significant part of these cameras. In fact, if you look at the Z6 II and Z7 II, 50% of the story is the fact that it has got two processors. So, better processors and AI. Now, in the near future, I think this is how Nikon is going to compete. They're going to put a Z30 just below Z50, and it's going to be uh, priced at around 500 US dollars of, of 600 US dollars at max. I think they will also introduce a Z70 going forward, which is going to be a 20 FPS 6K Pro uh, APS-C body. And I'm expecting that to be launched sometime this year. That is going to be a very, very exciting product for a lot of people. On the other extreme, you have the Z8 or the Z9 coming in. I also have this feeling that Z8 and Z9 might be actually two different bodies z8 being around 40 megapixel or 35 megapixel focusing on 6k probably and focusing more on video and a much higher megapixel z9 could be a 61 megapixel uh, camera or even an 80 or 100 megapixel camera i don't know but my feeling is that that will be more uh, that will be a smarter way to segment the market but at least you can you can get a, a 40 to 50 or 35 to 50 megapixel body with that can do 20 to 30 fps 8k and pro full frame body now so nikon's strategy so far has been fundamentally to to do three things overall at a market level make the full frame entry barrier lower right make more affordable full frame nikons they might introduce even better products and replace a z6 with something else probably update the z6 and Fill in that gap uh, at 1700 uh, US dollars. Slice the price segments very thin. Every camera at around 250 or 300 US dollars. Offer the same Nikon standard of reliability, sturdiness, quality, ergonomics, ease of use. These are things that actually have been uh, working for Nikon. Now, Nikon's winning strategy is clearly therefore to price bodies right in a market that is getting more expensive. Understand this. In a market that is getting more expensive, Nikon's strategy is to price it right suddenly you stand out where every mirrorless body is getting expensive 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 you get a brand that's that seems to be caring about you and giving a product within your grasp and which is sort of sounds reasonable every product is quite well priced and fantastic bodies however the strategy is also to charge a premium for all lenses because look you should actually make the body affordable and then you probably buy one lens as you like the system, you move on and buy another lens, another lens. But is any of it working? That is a question that a lot of you are asking. Is any of it working at all? Let's look at the actual stats. In third quarter of the financial year 2021, the, as you can see here, they've actually made a profit of 9.9 .9 billion yen. This is uh, shown in billions of yen, which is about 93 million dollars. So they have made profit in the third quarter but the over the same time overall for the year so far till uh, the third quarter they have also made quite a bit of loss uh, but that tells you that they're turning around things are falling in place and of course the la the first couple of quarters for everyone has been extremely bad but more importantly look at the profitability ratio in 2020, the profitability ratio, they made an operating profit of 4 uh, billion yen, but the profitability ratio was 2.6%. And this year, for the third quarter, the profitability ratio was 6.6%. That's a 200% increase in profitability. Now, moving on, if you look at this figure, FCF, that means free cash flow, which is 
how much money is left with you to sort of pay for your businesses and everything after all your cash uh, um, outlays are done that has increased by 21.7 billion yen that's a lot of money versus last year third quarter right this is right now at a pretty healthy figure now this has in for the entirety of nikon if you break it down and look at the imaging division products business only you will see something very interesting the imaging products business has actually made less revenue but the operating profit is also with they have made 25% less revenue this year for this quarter compared to last year this quarter and although the operating profit is still in the red it is a much better figure than last year so if it, if this was to if this was to do 25% better you wouldn't have seen the, this operating profit in the negatives you would have seen it in the positives now overall as a company if you look at the first to third quarter which is the three quarters for 2000 for, uh, for for the year ending march 31st 2021 you will see that the free free cash flow has actually improved overall for the company despite actually bleeding for the first two quarters by uh, 5.7 billion yen which is very promising on this one they are actually reporting that the shift to mid to high end models uh, for pro as pro and hobbyist market has been progressing smoothly and the unit sales has rid, risen they've also talked about how the contribution from z62 and z72 has been very very good and that has actually changed their overall position financial position and what people have not actually reported you know that's the thing that when nikon came out and said look we're going to make so much we're anticipating so much loss the loss has been now revised as and not a lot of people actually have spoken about it the revised anticipated loss is now actually 10 billion yen less which is a good news so i told you that they are definitely this this third quarter has been a point of return but like i said and like i had expected there has not been a lot of conversation on that in fact there has not been acknowledgement of that no one has gone through the data in fact you know what um i think it was petapixel or dp review i'm not sure someone had written an article and that they looked at only the three quarter result that did not appreciate that how the third quarter marks a new beginning for uh, nikon and perhaps a turnaround for the company so going forward what else do they need to do that's a big question i would say just market the sheer superiority of the z lenses lead it by the lenses market them well don't just make them so good market the z lenses very well that is very critical right now and i would say sell more lenses that should be their focus because you're not going to miraculously uh, increase your market share right now and nikon is actually not gunning for getting a higher market share uh, in terms of camera bodies but you need to convert uh, more buyers more camera buyers into more lens buyers now if you look at the numbers here this will tell you that about 38% people who buy a nikon camera not only this year but also last year in the last two years 38% of nikon buyers have bought another lens 38% in the category that is 70% 70% of the people who buy a new body they buy another lens which means nikon has to do much better they should actually do better than the category they should gun for uh, this ratio should be 2 is to 1 meaning if you have if you sell one body you should be able to sell at least a couple of lenses for that nikon needs to focus on getting more compact lenses out cheaper not the s quality lenses not the s line of lenses nikon should not shift focus slowly to making um, the compacts like the 28 mm that's not s lens that's going to come out the 40 mm that's not an s lens that's going to come out more 50 mm 58 mm maybe 85 mm uh, non s lenses those are important you know even wide angle lenses can be more uh, democratized by offering you know a very high quality nikon glass with a nikon uh, uh, focus motors inside it but may not be that big may not be that corrected may not be that expensive make nikon lenses create a secondary line of nikon lenses and make them more accessible to the market that's how you unlock the lens market so i think that that would be my suggestion to nikon and then also let's look at what the consumers actually want in the market and develop new products accordingly so 
I'd like to leave you here. If you look at the entire market right now, there are a few things that, that people are looking forward to, consumers want uh, to right now. There's a big casual content creator market and then there's a big pro content creators. But both these casual content creators and pro content creators are not your typical you know, $500 or you know, $400 entry-level camera buyers. They are in their mindset uh, enthusiasts and pros and they're willing to put in the extra money to do better in creating content or else they'll be using the phones. Now that's primarily a video market. So Nikon has to do much better in producing products for the casual content creators first, something that Fuji is targeting very well, something that Sony is trying to target with the A7C. That market with the flip screen is important. And I think Z70 with a decent 20 uh, um, megapixel, megapixel or 24 megapixel camera with a flip, flip screen with an IBIS inside it with nice, uh, you know, 10-bit uh, color coming straight out, the, out of the camera. Those things are going to be important. Z70 could be opening up a big market for Nikon and they can do it. Secondly, focus on young people and because they're the major creators, make them lightweight because, you know, if you take a Fuji out, I'm going to, people notice your Fuji and they tell you, oh, what a beautiful looking camera. It's important. Young creators look at the cameras as part of their uh, fashion. They wear the camera. They just don't carry it and use it. They want to carry something that looks good. You see Chris from DP Review keeps talking about how, you know, the, he actually gives a point for cameras that look better. People, young people, they want to look good with the cameras, simply. Okay, so, and then make them lightweight as much as possible, which is where the second rung of cheaper non-S lens compact primes and maybe even compact zooms are going to be important for Nikon. What are they looking at? They're looking at um, better sports shooting. They're looking at wildlife, low light. As they upgrade from phones, they're looking at uh, different lenses to play with. They're looking at manual control. They want to learn it. AI will reduce the gap between the everyday photographer and the pro photographer. That is important. Remember, AI is coming. It's going to hit us big time. You know, you want to take the usual shots, but there is still a learning curve to take those usual shots. The gap is going to reduce because AI is going to be able to do a lot more for those. You know, the learning uh, um, process is going to be faster because you want to have to learn so much, to be honest. The device today, the camera device tomorrow will replace the pro photographer to some extent, okay? The device. Um, therefore, the inventiveness and creativity and style will be a differentiator, which means Nikon should get into the business of training, mentoring, creating uh, uh, platforms for people to showcase their work, creating more visible award shows. Those things are going to be important. Okay, now, Nikon strategy in short for the future. Target young content creators. Pro APS-C, like I spoke about, Z70, flip screen video focused bodies, make a series of quality lightweight second rung lenses that are non S line. Focus on video again. Remarkable stride made on video. They're already making it. They've done fantastic jobs. You know, all you have to do is basically make 10 bit uh, video files and maybe if possible raw files available in body. And so they don't have to attach another external recorder to access that. The one thing that I wish Nikon is not late with is introduction of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is going to come in. Sony is already working on it. Canon has shown how their, their autofocus can actually detect birds so easily. But broadly, don't be late to the AI party and push the processor technology. The processor technology is going to be huge in future you know if i look at apple m1 has essentially has just you know it, it's like a few years leap that apple has taken with the m1 processor processor is going to be very important probably look at uh, deeper strategic ties with uh, processor makers perhaps why not with apple and i think that nikon is ready for its next phase of growth i think the camera market is going to shrink and you are not going to see a brand that has about 20% market share vanish. There's a high, much higher likelihood that much smaller brands might just exit the market because they're not working with so much market share. For example, if Nikon is to uh, exit the market, 
there's no way that uh, that 20% will be taken by Fuji or Panasonic. It's going to be taken by Sony and Canon. But if Fuji and Panasonic tomorrow leaves the market, that about 6 to 7% market share will be sh shared by Nikon, Canon, Fuji. So even if Nikon exists the market, there is no benefit for Fuji, no benefit for Panasonic. And those players will be sort of, you can say, muscled out by two suddenly much bigger players, Sony and Canon. So I don't think that's the way the market works. The three large players are going to exist. Nikon is not going to go anytime soon and they're looking much healthier in terms of their financials. They're ready for a much smaller market, which is not something everyone can talk about. No one has spoken about how they're actually bringing in efficiency in their business process like Nikon has. So I think it's all good news and I think you should just stop worrying about Nikon's future. Just enjoy your camera. They're lovely cameras. Thank you. See you around. Please subscribe. Thanks.